What is up, everyone? Welcome to this week's Nerdball Fantasy Football Show. I am your humble host and astronaut aboard the Pitts 8 Moon Expedition, Pete Rogers. And I am joined today by all of the nerds. We have resident old man and millinery ex- extraordinaire, Clark Barnes. Lead saxophonist for Diami Brown and the downtown funky crown band, the working girl, Jordan Smith. And queen bee of the Austin Eckler Hive, Ginger Woodsman, Nick Bodiford. Guys, how are we doing today? Doing great, Pete. Doing well. Good, Pete. How are you? I am splendid before we started recording nick and i were just reminiscing about the glorious haircuts that we both just got today so thank you all for noticing uh we appreciate that uh and uh, and now it's it makes me feel like every time i say ginger woodsman and you're not woodsy it's just like what do we do and now people can see your face and so they have never even seen you with a beard to know of the ginger woodsman i feel like we should start a petition to bring the ginger woodsman back in full force if you can uh, speed up climate change to the point that it's cold next week, then I'll grow the beard again. But it's I kind of let the seasons dictate my facial hair. I just think that's a, uh, a humble brag by Nick that he's like, I can grow a beard in a week. Watch me. That's that's what uh, that's what that comment was really about. Nick just bragging about his facial hair growth. Um, all right. Well, we are going to uh, play a game to talk about some rankings since we're kind of in the doldrums of the NFL season. There's no NFL news really to get you, but uh, can I interest you guys in some Pete Rogers news before we uh, get to the ranking game show Uh, a little, make it quick, make it quick. Okay. I'm sorry. All right. I'll make it, I'll make it really quick. Uh, Becca and I are expecting twins in December. So holy cow. All right. (laughs) That has been a, Thank you. Thank you. That has been a, uh, uh, a whirlwind to go through. We first found out we were pregnant in when, when, when was that March? She's pregnant. Let's give credit where credit. Yes. Due. That's a hundred percent. I have done one thing and then I've been out of the loop since then. <laughs> I think, um, but yeah, we found I've out. I've never heard the, sorry, go, no, it's your time to shine Pete. Take it away. Oh, thanks Nick. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So we found out she was pregnant and then like, assuming it was one and then she had a, a scheduled an ultrasound at six weeks and i couldn't go in because of covid so she was just in there by herself and she was like the the, the nurse was because presumably you know they've done this to hundreds of patients before she was like oh looks like you got two in there are you uh do you guys expecting twins <laughs> and uh, deal just twice as many babies. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So Becca was like, came out in a state of shock uh, afterwards. So, uh, so yeah, it's been a whirlwind. It's been a whirlwind to go from knowing that we were going to have a kid to now knowing we're going to have two kids. Uh, and we found out last week that they're both girls. Uh, so we're going to have two twin girls coming in December. It's uh, very exciting for all of us. So I got lots of thoughts on this one, but I'll just keep it to this one that I've always thought Raising a kid, probably like making a sandwich. You know, once you get all the stuff out, you might as well make two if you're going to do it. <laughs> that is sound advice. Sound advice that we'll carry close to our hearts as, we, as we're as we dealing with uh, two kids crying at different points throughout the night. Yeah, when you started that by saying that we're expecting twins, I was like, are you? Like, did you go into this? And you're like, let's go for two, babe. You know, yeah. just got a good feeling about it just got we're just like fingers crossed we're really hoping that we're about to have twins uh yes no it has been double ultrasound we have seen them both and uh they are healthy young little babies and uh so yeah so that is we're gonna be moving in two weeks or not two weeks two months to a bigger apartment uh because of that so this glorious background you see you will only get to enjoy dear viewers for a little bit of time, but then it'll be another glorious background that we'll uh, have to construct. The only thing that changes faster than the seasons is the backgrounds that Pete has <laughs> from spot to spot when he's moving into new places. Yeah, especially during this last year where I was bouncing between the cabin we were staying in and my parents' house, and now we're back in Ann Arbor, and then we're going to be moving yet again. And then we'll be there for a year, and then we'll be moving. Oh, my gosh, there's so much so much going on in the future. But anyways, uh, yeah, so NFL, get your shit together. We we had this news break because we were like, all right, well, the NFL is not going to do anything. So, you know, we got to give the people what they want and give some, uh, 
give some exciting news to really grasp the, na the nation's attention. Uh, and so we've done just that. Um, all right. Well, let's play a game, you guys. Let's play a game. Whoa. I almost went into Would You Rather because I'm just so used to when we play a game. I was like, oh, that's the only game we play. No, in fact, we were playing. Why'd you rank them there? Question mark, exclamation mark. Uh, point of the game is very simple. Very simple, very straightforward. I have perused Nick's, Clark's, and Jordan's initial rankings for the 2021 NFL, uh, NFL season, fantasy football season, and have picked out a few key players whom they have ranked higher or lower than kind of the general fantasy cognoscenti, and we will demand that they explain their reasoning behind these rankings so that you, the listeners, uh, can get a better sense as to maybe is there, is there someone who the fantasy football general community is hyping up more than they should or are sleeping on? So Clark, let's start with you. And we're going to talk about Philip Lindsay, the running back for the now Houston Texans. And I promise you, this is not just Clark's hometown bias because he's sworn off the Houston Texans. He is, in fact, uh, the NFL's number one free agent fan. Philip Lindsay, Clark, enters a backfield along with Mark Ingram, David Johnson, and Rex Burkhead, sexy Rexy, is there uh, with question marks at the quarterback position, question marks at this offense entirely. And yet, nonetheless, in half-point PPR, you have Philip Lindsay as your running back 25, 25 ahead of guys like J.K. Dobbins, Mike Davis, Kareem Hunt. So, Clark, we, the listeners, must know, why'd you rank them there? All right, so this is a good one to uh, warm up on. Not entirely committed to this one. These ranks came out a <laughs> while ago. Uh, I am going to end up higher than consensus on Philip Lindsay, though. So this is a good one to start. He probably comes down a couple of notches, but I keep him ahead of J.K. Dobbins. Uh, Kareem Hunt's probably going to jump over him. Mike Davis absolutely will. Nick has proselytized, and I am now a believer in the big Mike Davis. Can't, can't uh, say no to those quads is getting volume argument, which is a very, very good argument. But uh, pretty simple, uh, subject to change as we get more information. Uh, you kind of sold why I think Philip Lindsay is going to be a, a low-end RB2 contributor this year. It's because he's in a backfield with Mark Ingram and uh, David Johnson and Rex Burkhead. Uh, Philip Lindsay's good. He's a good running back. And the Texans, while... They are not going to be very good. Uh, teams have about five, 600 offensive plays a year, probably going to score about 30, 40 touchdowns, even if they're terrible. And I think Philip Lindsay is just kind of hands down the best running back there. So it's one of those absolutely uninteresting picks that lets you have a very solid flex or RB2 uh, that you've picked in the eighth, ninth round uh, when everyone else is you know, reaching for the rookie wide receiver who's just not going to produce anything. I have Lindsay as my running back 38, and I thought that was uh, daring. But none, I have nowhere near reached the level of daringness that is Clark Barnes. Well done, sir. And we don't know that Deshaun Watson is not going to play. This like, is true. I, I know this everyone is the NFL. That, this but... is the NFL, after all, where he maybe gets a slight slap on the wrist and uh, you know is suspended two games and then comes back onto the field, a la Ben Roethlisberger. So, uh, a, man, th this is just a, a difficult backfield to want anything to do with. Um, we like even even like moderate or mediocre running backs um, in in good offenses. Like we're all about that, right? Like uh, offenses that score uh, a lot of points, they're going to give the ball to the running back a lot. I have David Johnson as the leader in this backfield, and he's the RB forty seven. I don't want anything to do with this um with this team really i think some savvy folks will go after brandon cooks but yeah that for, for me the right, good for you um you. good you. luck with tyrod taylor getting him the ball gonna um, love it absolutely here for it <laughs> yeah but uh i i definitely am out on the philip Lindsay sweepstakes no he's a man he's a man who i could talk myself into and you can definitely make the pitch for it being like a real sneaky, maybe not regular RB2 numbers, but like certainly like flex numbers and can give you the off uh, RB2 day. But yeah, I, I, I mean, 
there is a there's a case to be made clark and you before after you told yourself told us all that your rankings are going to wildly change uh did a great job justifying your rankings <laughs> mild adjustment i still think like with nick saying that he has david johnson at 46 like Lindsay's going to be way above that for me he's still going to probably be in the middle mid 30s yeah you know so I, I stick by the premise i was going with pre-draft sounds good sounds good Nick, let's move on to yourself. First player we're going to address with you. <clears throat> quarterback Trey Lance. He's a rookie quarterback playing <laughs> with Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco. But there is that Jimmy G in front of him. Is Jimmy G going to be in front of him? How many games will Trey Lance actually play? Trey Lance, is he, he's only played like, what, five games in college? I don't even know if that's true. I think he threw like 40 pass attempts what is Trey Lance is? Is Trey Lance good? We don't even know. And yet, Nick, you have him ranked as your QB nine. The people want to know, Nick, why'd you rank him there? So I, I want to start this off sort of like Clark did, where we give explanations as to why we can't actually be wrong. And if we are, it's not our <laughs> fault. <laughs> Perfect. So we do look at the rankings as like, uh, an, uh, for right now, it's a tool for either a way to get an edge in drafts or uh, avoid pitfalls. My approach to Trey Lance is, is pretty simple uh, in terms of what he could offer to your roster. He was viewed as one of the smartest quarterbacks in the draft. He's a dual threat guy with a cannon for an arm. Uh, we've seen Robert Griffin have extreme success on the ground while working with Kyle Shanahan in Washington. The schedule lines up very favorably with them facing not very good defenses and extremely good offenses. This team is going to be built. I know they have a talented defensive roster, but it's going to call upon both the quarterback and the run game. And Trey Lance, if he's a starter, is going to feature into both of those categories. Um Having him as my quarterback nine does not mean that I think you should draft him between quarterback eight and quarterback 10. It's where I think he could finish if the stars all align. And right now he's currently going per fantasy football calculator in half point PPR drafts. He's going as the 21st overall quarterback in round 13, the beginning of round 13. So the way that I see this playing out is that you grab someone like Baker Mayfield in the 11th round or even Wentz in the 10th, you get someone who offers you a stable baseline you draft Trey Lance maybe a round or two early and you wait a couple games if necessary for him to take the leap and, and take the reins and, and take over this extremely well-coached offense. That's the long and short of it. I mean, it's, it, I think it will be, if he is the quarterback, I think it will be very difficult for him to fail. I think that's, I agree with that. I like the, I like the, uh, the justification of your rankings, not actually being where you rank them, but where they might be. It's a good, a good caveat to, to throw in there subtly. Uh, no, like Trey Lance is, Trey Lance is one of those guys who is stepping into his, like, I am super high on Justin Fields this year. And, and when I say super high, I think he's my QB. Let me quickly look Justin Fields, QB 21. Um, so like, you know, not crazy high, but like I have him, I have him there. Uh, and, but that's real, you know, that's trusting that he's going to get the majority of starts in Chicago, which I really think he will. I think Matt Nagy's full of crap right now. Um, and if Trey Lance gets a majority of starts in San Francisco, like the, the, the opportunity and the offense that he is stepping into is drastically better than the opportunity offense that Justin Fields is stepping into. So I certainly understand and, and can see the move of like Trey Lance as being that guy where, you he's going for free, right? He's not going to like, you don't have to really expend any high capital to get him. And his potential is off the charts because of the system he's in because of the talent that he has and the weapons that he's going to be playing with Debo Samuel, Brandon, IU, George Kittle, uh, Trey Sermon in the backfield, along with Raheem Mostert and the brilliance of Kyle Shanahan. Like all the pieces are there for him to come out of the word work to be a solid QB one. Um, so it's, it's bold in the sense that like, if you were to draft Trey Lance as your QB one, as the like, you know, a top 10 QB power to you, that, that takes some cojones. Um, but certainly using Nick's rankings, using Nick's spot there as more of a like, Hey, this guy has this potential. Just make sure you kind of sneak him on your roster whenever you can. 
a, maybe a, a better way. Yeah, I like that. I like that approach. I can get behind that approach. Yeah, I like this rank. I like it even at nine. Uh, Lance was my highest rated rookie quarterback coming into the league before we knew where he was going to go, just running and throwing. Uh, and I knew Trevor Lawrence was going to go to the Jags. So big arrow down for him, unfortunately. Uh, I, th- I think Lance is, is very good and he's going to be going to a good team. He's everything that people love about Jalen Hurts, except Lance is good. And so I think having him as the number Shots nine fire. quarterback is not unreasonable at all. And picking him at nine and then doing something boring, like taking Ben Roethlisberger, who may lead the league in yards for the first eight games again, that's a very solid strategy. So to your, to your point about Jalen Hurts, the comparison, that was where I wanted to like draw the line. And so Hurts is number 10 for me. And I'm just mm-hmm. thinking like, I, Good San man. Francisco, it's got a better roster. It's got a better uh, fantasy wise. It's got a better schedule. Uh, and I think that Trey Lance is, it has the potential to be better than Jalen Hurts. So I, and I like Jalen Hurts cause I think he's going to run like crazy, but like, let's put him ahead. That's sure. I had to put him above there. Cause I like his prospects yeah. more. Sounds good. I like the pick of getting Trey Lance um, at some point in your draft. I put him in the same kind of category as Justin Fields, just because those guys are two people who, I mean, if we, we might've missed this news is that Matt Nagy said there wasn't a way that Justin Fields was going to be the starter in week one, which is like chef's kiss. Very perfect. (laughs) Um, But I think that these two will start at some point this season and rather than end up in like, that no man's land where you might pick, I don't know, Russell Wilson or like Aaron Rodgers in some higher round, like in the fifth where we like us on this show, don't really like drafting QBs in those rounds. Um, That's some place where you could sit back and just get a really high floor rookie who could run the ball. Yeah. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, especially if you're going to avoid, if you're either going to go super high, what is, what is, what was the, tr- what's the thing that's going around now? It's not zero RB. It's, it's like mitigated zero RB. Or modified. It's, modified. It's modified, modified zero, RB. zero RB. This has been going on for a year and <laughs> so this is, someone shat their pants about it. And now everybody's freaking out. So it was, what's the modified, modified zero QB is either you draft, either you draft in the fifth, spend a first or second round pick on a QB, or you don't touch them until the 15th round. Love it. Z- modified zero RB is the dumbest shit in the world. Let the record show. <laughs> it's not modified zero RB. If you're drafting like an RB in the first round and then not touching RB, that's not, that's not zero RB. Anyways, uh, we can have, we can have whomever, whoever is throwing a Twitter fit on, on the show to discuss why modified zero RB is a real thing that we should take seriously. Uh, Jordan, welcome to the hot seat. Curtis Samuel, wide receiver for the Carolina Panthers, had a great year last year despite being overthrown multiple times by Teddy Bridgewater and is now taking his talents, rejoined with Ron Rivera in Washington to play with the Washington football team. You seem a little bit lower on Curtis Samuel, though, than maybe the general public. Jordan, why'd you rank him there? Yeah, that... uh three-person list I sent you was just me messing around I don't know if you understood that after I set my actual list in there um I can't talk about why I'm like lower on Curtis Samuel um basically to peel back the onion curtain for these folks I did a ranking of like 100 players today um just to kind of and it was something on paper and um I guess the argument would be is that Ryan Fitzpatrick is still the quarterback. And I know a lot of people might be picking Washington to win the NFC East or to be really good contenders. And while the defense is really good, Ryan Fitzpatrick is still a quarterback that is good for a little while and then ends up turning into a pumpkin. Uh, There's a reason he's been bouncing around the past couple of years. And if anything, Ryan Fitzpatrick is more of a deep shot kind of guy. Um, So I think Terry McLaurin will still eat pretty well. Um, And I think that's uh, the rookie Diami Brown is going to, I know. There's a reason why you are lead saxophonist for the (laughs) Diami Brown uh, band. 
I am still pretty high on him. He's a blue chip prospect that, you know, went to North Carolina, but did have offers from other like much more pronounced uh, football schools like Alabama and other teams in the SEC, Notre Dame, I think too. Um, and I think that he might emerge as a deep threat as we've seen over the years that uh, like with the exception of Henry Ruggs that um, like deep ball guys and guys that can get down the field are generally pretty good to start. Um, I'm not saying that Diami Brown is going to, you know, eclipse all of my uh, expectations of rookie wide receivers, but I think that he's more of a guy that Ryan Fitzpatrick would want to target deep down the field. And uh, with Antonio Gibson there, who's kind of going to be taking the Christian McCaffrey role, I don't see Curtis Samuel doing all that much differently than when he was in Carolina with Ron Rivera. So um, that's why I'm a little bit lower on Curtis Samuel. I think he could be a good flex player, but I'm not expecting him to be like the actual number two in Washington. Yeah, it's, I think you bring up a good point, And this is something that I am interested to see what his role will ultimately be in Washington because of the fact that I wonder if a lot of his touches like manufactured touches in the offense last year in Carolina was because Christian McCaffrey was injured. Um, and, and I don't have the numbers in front of me to see whether like if his touches increased or decreased, particularly like his end around sweeps and, and kind of quick screens plays that I know that he was being very productive with last year uh, as well as downfield shots. But those were, you know, those are still kind of in that offense, but the, the manufactured touches without Christian McCaffrey, like that makes sense. And I wonder with Antonio Gibson there who Ron Rivera has already like, their, their staff has been hyping up uh, Antonio Gibson throughout this entire offseason, talking about him basically being a Christian McCaffrey 2.0 or Christian McCaffrey light. I wonder if that other side of Curtis Samuels off uh, of game won't be there in Washington. And that will obviously take some of that kind of high floor that Samuel seemingly comes into as he works his way into this offense. And we've seen before wide receivers like coming into a new offense. It doesn't necessarily always translate to great fantasy production. I I think I agree with you that he's he's a, a maybe a flex or or like a fringe wide receiver four in terms of where you'd rank him and where you draft him. Um, but he could be the scary thing about it is that like if he clicks, he did look so good last year and so much of his production. I shouldn't say so much. A good amount of his production was just like there. It was there. He was open and the throw was just missed. Um, and if that comes to fruition in Washington, he could put up some really good numbers, which would suddenly rocket him from being like a fringe flex guy to, you know, high end wide receiver too, possibly. So uh, in regards to Curtis Samuel's uh, rushing production last year, no, it, it was pretty evenly dispersed, uh, dispersed throughout the season. Uh, he had some two carry okay. games and four carry games early on. Then it dropped down to like one to three. He had one big one that was uh, seven carries. I think in the second to last week of the season, uh, you piqued my interest with this comment about him being uh, what R Rivera is saying, something about how he was going to be used as a, a rusher. My news following of the uh, of all things Curtis Samuel has indicated um, quite the opposite. I, I was under the impression that he was moving more towards being a full-time receiver in the Washington offense, which is why I, I like him a lot. And, Trying to find so he's going in the ninth round right now, according to Fantasy Football Calculator. I think that's a totally appropriate price to uh, pay for a guy who's going to be like a, a weekly flex play. That I don't think you have to think about the matchup uh, too much. Um, but this the news surrounding whether or not he's going to be more involved in the run game or if he's actually just going to be the number two receiver there. I don't. I think. I mean. I think Diami Brown is like. I think he's a great fit there for what they need in the offense. I don't expect him to challenge uh, target total wise Curtis Samuel at all. Um, and I don't expect the running backs necessarily to take that many passes. Like I, I think McKissick's kind of out. I think McKissick's there, is kind of gone. Um, I, I'm hoping it's all Antonio Gibson. Yeah. Um, I think that that'll be the case. And I think, I think Fitz finally showed us that he's actually ready to be a full-time starter after last season. We'll see how this plays out, but I think the whole thing hinges on, yeah, what just just continuing to monitor the news to find out what Rivera is saying. Yes, agreed. Uh, All right, let's loop back around. Clark, we're coming back to you. 
I hope you've got your fireproof pants on because the hot seat just turned back on. You held up a piece of paper and I don't know what it said. I've got my note card here. <laughs> perfect, perfect. There it is. Um, so uh, last year's fantasy breakout star, rookie wide receiver Justin Jefferson for the Minnesota Vikings comes in, sets the world ablaze, absolutely torches everything we've ever known to be humanly possible uh, done by a rookie wide receiver. And honestly, what is going to get broken again by Jamar Chase. So make sure you draft Jamar Chase. Uh, this year, Justin Jefferson consensus consensus wide receiver one consensus top seven wide receiver that is where he is going that is what you're paying from you're totally fine with that except for you clark barnes clark barnes you have justin jefferson ranked as your wide receiver 15 the people want to know why'd you rank him there and so unlike my meandering back pedal from my philip Lindsay rank i looked at this one and thought yep that <laughs> sounds about right uh, and this is not a condemnation. I thought that 15 was like super high on Justin Jefferson. I know that he had a great year last year and I'm not dogging Justin Jefferson, but here's my line of thinking. Bring out the no card. Everyone else has Justin Jefferson ranked ahead of Michael Thomas. Who's done it sure. for like five years. Everyone else has Michael Thomas or has a, DK Metcalf ranked below Justin Jefferson, who's who's done it a couple of times on a much better offense where he is the featured wide receiver. I think Adam Thielen is still going to be the featured wide receiver because Dirk Cousins wants him to be the featured wide receiver, at least enough to eat into it to where I can tell myself at the end of the second round, I would rather go for DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, Michael Thomas, something like that instead of Justin Jefferson. So this is not me impugning Justin Jefferson's skill. What he did was amazing. While the Vikings pass offense is not very prolific, it is extremely narrow. So I'm not going to make a case about how Justin Jefferson is going to fall off a cliff the other way, but there's just too many guys who've been too consistent for too long to put ahead of him. So I, I'm, I'm going to stick by that 15 rank. Right. And so I did see that, uh, what's his name in Chicago was above him. And if Andy Dalton's going to get the start for 10 games, then Alan Robinson, then Robinson may creep below Justin. Jefferson. There's no way if I will put a wheel bet on Andy Dalton starting less than 10 I, games. I want to know if a coach has ever been fired, like in camp. <laughs> for not playing, <laughs> like just in, like <laughs> week two of the preseason has passed. Matt Nagy has been cut from the Chicago bears. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, Clark, would you feel more confident in Justin Jefferson this year if, to quote Justin Jefferson himself, Kirk Cousins had a little more swag? So I'm not – I love Narrative Street, but I try to separate my analysis from it too much. Okay. But, but – and I don't know. That's the kind of bleep that's, that's going to get you playing the second fiddle even if you're better. Like, it, why would you say that? Yeah, And maybe he meant it in a harmless way. Maybe he's trying to pump up Kirk Cousins of being like, hey, you don't have to be so modest. You're being really good. But don't that's, be so modest. Kirk Cousins, what, your swag is off the charts. Really brag about your swag, Kirk. I just, oof, yeah, I don't know. All right. This is how, this is how Clark is going to, this is going to come to fruition is, is Justin Jefferson has iced himself out by uh, calling, Not rightfully iced. calling Kirk Cousins <laughs> swagless. <laughs> Over under four voice cracking, you like that videos. <laughs> you like that? Is all that directed, swag or is that not swag? I don't all, which I think one is I would that? assume that's swag, but maybe it's all okay. uh, uh, addressed to Justin Jefferson. Maybe Justin Jefferson's always behind the camera. And every time Kirk Cousins sees him after throwing five touchdowns, force feeding uh, Adam Thielen on, and just ignoring Justin, he's like, you like that? Jefferson's like, uh, so Clark, we'll how about it? we'll do a uh, we'll we'll do one of these here uh, wheel bets, and I'll say that that uh, playing at least fourteen games, Justin Jefferson finishes uh, as a wide receiver one and half point PBR scoring. And I know you don't like all the stipulations, but I did them anyway. No, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet against that. Okay. Oh, okay. damn it! <laughs> right, like I just so I try to do my ranks of how I would draft people. Not how they're yeah. going to finish, just how I look at it. And so 
if you wanted to bet, I bet Michael Thomas finishes above Justin Jefferson. I'll do that. Like that's, let's do it. I just okay. think that there's a little right. bit more safety with Michael Thomas. Um, Michael. Anyway, we don't need to run through this. But like, I don't even think you're necessarily kind of wrong. I just yeah. want to make a bet. We just you got I'm my in. juices flowing. All right, cool. Nice. When Nick's juice is flowing, watch out. There, it's coming down and it's going to do something. All right, Michael Thomas finishes above Justin Jefferson. Clark is making that bet and Nick is taking him. I uh, I think even with Taysom Hill starting for the New Orleans even Saints with all Taysom year. Hill as, as the Saints starting quarterback. Um, yeah, I have Justin Jefferson as my wide receiver eight. And I agree, I agree, Clark, that like the, the Justin Jefferson hype on some level has gotten a bit too far. Like I have seen him, like, what is he currently going on uh fancy football calculator? Uh, Steve, go, go do that research. Let me see. Uh, but some of the hype, like I've seen him going er- early. So like early enough that you're like, okay, that seems like a bit much. He is a rookie. You know, he had an incredible year. Things will be different. Justin Jefferson, wide receiver nine in, in F and according to fancy football calculator going at the beginning of the third round. That sounds good to me. I'll take that. I like that. Um, yeah. So I think uh, ultimately I think Clark's just wrong. So that's, you know, that's what we, that's what we come on to the show is to just uh, tell Clark he's wrong. What we're going to do Pete is we're going to compare uh, Jefferson and Thielen to AJ Brown and Julio. And then we're like, if you like those guys, then you have to like these guys and we'll make the argument as though he's making like an argument against AJ Brown. It'll be great. Perfect. We're going to get perfect. It. So Clark hates, hates AJ Brown and Julio. He thinks that right. they are yeah. average receivers. And then uh, if he tries funny, to, well, it's funny you bring this up, Nick. Yeah. Because you think Devonte Adams is an average receiver. Let's not, let's not, let's not, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, not diminish the lead. What is it? High the lead, whatever. Uh, yeah, bury Devontae the Adams. <laughs> yeah, bury the lead. Let's not bury the lead here. Devontae like Adams. Diminish. diminish the lead. Let's yeah. not diminish the lead. Uh, everyone's wide receiver one was the wide receiver one last year. He is wide receiver one in Jordan's heart. Jordan has Devontae Adams tattooed on his heart. It is there. And yet, and look at it. He it's literally has his name process. above him. Devontae Adams watches over Jordan as he does this show. And yet, Nick, you have the audacity, the gall, the stones to rank him as your wide receiver nine in half point PPPR. PPPR. Nick, PPPR. Why'd you rank him there? So this one's really a process and timeline decision. I also have to lean into my brand with being on the Aaron Rodgers won't be the Green Bay starter in week one. Yes, this uh, is true. You have so many wheel bets going on this that you need to really buy, like abide by this. I'm spinning constantly. Um, yeah. yeah, so there was another report. I didn't read it. I didn't listen to it, but I tagged Clark in it. And it was it's about how Aaron Rodgers isn't going to be the starter in week one. Um, for real, though. What I, the way that I went about this was basically looking at all of the uh, like elite wide receiver ones and saying, okay, if it's Jordan Love or Aaron Rodgers, like if we're having to try to figure out which guy is there, you know, there's a chance that Jordan Love's going to be the one that's throwing the ball to these guys. Um, and, and I operate with that decision making and I make all of these draft selections of other wide receiver ones and I'm wrong. And Aaron Rodgers ends up being the guy. Am I upset? With having guys like Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, I can list them all. But the point is, the answer to that is no. I'm I'm like DeAndre Hopkins. I'm gonna be okay with that. That's that I, like that's not gonna be a thing where I log in every week and I'm like shit. All I have is this elite wide receiver one here starting. Um, but I don't have to worry about who that starting quarterback is going to be. Clark, we touched on earlier the fact that neither one of us are all that high on Jalen Hurts' passing ability. I am lower on Jordan Love's passing ability than I am on Jalen Hurts. If Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback, and I'm, I'm not even going to bother going into like strength of schedule stuff, because if he's a quarterback, then great. We're like We don't have anything to talk about here. We are all good. Devontae Adams immediately goes back to being the wide receiver one. But if we're drafting right now, we're drafting in mid June. Am I going to feel crappy that I end up with Calvin Ridley as my wide receiver one instead of a guy who might have Jordan Love as, as his quarterback? No, I'm not going to feel bad about that at all. As we continue to get closer to August, like normal draft season, and we have more media reports, 
I'm totally going to update this. But for right now, I want to minimize risk in the first and second round as much as possible and just nail a guy who I think is going to be awesome. My only note here is I, I just absolutely love the commitment. The commitment to the bit is key. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to have a bit, it's not you a bit. Gotta... If, you, if you have a belief and, and what you've outlined is absolutely accurate, it's like fair. I made fun of Hertz. If it's love, I am not going to, yeah, I'm going to change my rank on Adams, but you just, I mean, sometimes I, I set the story in my head, not changing it. Jordan, as our resident Packers fan, how far would Devonte Adams slide down your rankings if Jordan Love started? If you knew before your draft, Jordan Love was going to start 12 games this year. I mean, the hilarious part is that if Jordan Love is the starter in week one, he still might be the best starting quarterback in the NFC North. So I think that's <laughs> something to consider. Um, no, I, I just needed to take shots at all the other uh, Jared Goffs, Kirk Cousins, and Andy Dalton to the world. Um, no, I, based on my own like personal draft strategy, I have like, you know, starting with Tyree kill up wide receiver one, I still have Adams at two and followed by Diggs, Hopkins, Ridley, Metcalf, AJ Brown, uh, Justin Jefferson and Keenan Allen. I kind of have them in their own, like first tier as in like, I don't know if I'm in the back half of the first round and I'm swinging around in the snake and I can get one of those guys in the second and I absolutely will but my strategy is kind of trying to get an elite running back first um, in the first round and then seeing what's there in the second so I can't really argue against why or Devontae Adams being two or nine I'm still probably taking him in the first two rounds uh, just because he is not really a a one trick guy. Um, he's going to be a safety blanket, no matter who's back there. And he's going to get probably still just peppered with targets. Cause I don't think love is going to have the same kind of connection with some of those other guys on the roster. I would maybe boost up Robert Tunyon because of that too, but that's about it. Okay. Before we move on, Nick, uh, Michael Thomas, fancy fo- football calculators going as the wide receiver eight and half point PPR. And his draft slot is last pick of the second round. Okay. So if you were at there, you were, you're picking at the 12th spot in the second round and Devonte Adams is sitting there. You would not take Devonte Adams. I've got, I've got uh, Adam. I've got uh, Michael Thomas is my wide receiver 11. I don't care about that, Nick. That's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I would take Wait. Michael Thomas. You would take, no, okay. No, I would take Devontae Adams. It but that's you, that's wide receiver eight slot then, Nick. That's one above where you had him. That's the whole point. Ugh. My point, my middle of the second round. If it was middle of the second round, would you take Devontae Adams? Uh, it's it's going to come down to who's left on the board. Would I have a problem ending up with him? No, I'm not. I don't. I would okay. not be like no, not Devontae Adams. Um, Okay. You're just not going to, you're not, you're not going to like be working hard to get him in those first two rounds. If he's there sitting for you pretty, you're like, awesome. Love it. I'll ride with it. But you're not going to be like at that, you know, back into the first round. You're like, I gots to get me some Devonte Adams. Probably not. No. Okay. I, All yeah. Right. All right. A lot of hedging on this bit. Um, all right, let's wrap it up then. <laughs> you pick the guy. If we're ready to talk about. <laughs> Don't put this on me. Don't put this on me, Nicholas. Uh, Jordan, let's wrap up. Uh, a guy who I am very intrigued by, and you are very intrigued by, and whom I think the more and more I've been seeing about him and been thinking about it and mulling it over in my head, the more and more I kind of like him as a, as a good sleeper pick in this year uh, fantasy football, and that is running back for the Miami Dolphins, Miles Gaskin. Uh, you're high on him, Jordan. You got him ranked good at a, at a good spot in in your among your running backs so why'd you rank them there um so i have miles gaskin as, as running back 22 um i think this predominantly falls under the category of miles gaskin being the guy who will get the most carries without a lot of threat from people behind him um save for like gaskin got hurt last year and they were scrambling to find somebody else um like for example guys behind them that i have are kareem hunt who 
is in a very obvious timeshare. Um, DeAndre Swift, who I don't know, does the coach even want him on the team no anymore? Does. Like this is just kind of ridiculous. So as it stands right now, until I see something else, DeAndre Swift is going to be ranked pretty low on my board. Um, Travis Etienne again in a, another apparent timeshare. Um, Melvin Gordon, James Robinson, you get the idea. It's just um, trying to find guys who I feel like are going to get the most touches. Um, I think the Dolphins did a pretty decent job of shoring up their offense. There's going to be a lot of spacing going on over there, um, especially with the weapons that they added, whether that's Jalen Waddle or um, Will Fuller or getting Preston Williams just back on the mm-hmm. field. He's a pretty good field stretcher as well. So I, th- I think that Miles Gaskin is the type of running back that can help um, a young quarterback in Tua, uh, who I'm still very much in on, but it's just nice to have a running back who can kind of take the stress off the shoulders of a guy who is, who knows if he's going to be fully like okay health wise going forward in his career. So he's just going to need all the support that he can get. And I think Gaskin is a guy who can help get him that. Yeah, I alluded to, I mean, I was saying this when introducing this bit. Uh, I have become more and more into Miles Gaskin as as a like seemingly a pretty solid RB2 with some possible RB1 like games in him. Uh, over on Nerdball, we got lots of stats for you to sift through. And one of those is we looked at uh, all the 22, uh, 2020 team red zone plays. And so we have red zone plays and whether the pass breakdown run breakdown and field goals. And so we have all those percentages there. And if you look, the Dolphins were fourth in the NFL last year in terms of run percentage in the red zone. And seemingly there's no one there in that backfield challenging Miles Gaskin. So he has the inside track to being the the lead workhorse there in an offense that has a lot more passing weapons to open up the ground game so that you're not having defenses, you know, sitting on, you know, putting nine in the box or eight in the box, stacking the box. Uh, And it's a team that when it gets into the red zone last year, it ran the ball more, you know, one of the most in the NFL. And so like all of those things make a recipe for Gaskin to be like a a guy who's, who's still, I don't feel like his ADP has reached what his true value could be in 2021. So I really, I really like him. If you're drafting now as to like a guy to buy low on now, his ADP probably will rise, especially if news out of camp is that like, no one's really challenging him. Uh, but he's, he is someone who I will be targeting in almost all my drafts, uh, given his current ADP. Yeah. Gaskin's going to get knocked because he was hurt last year. So when people sort stats, he's not going to pop to the top. Uh, he's like five, nine. If you trust the combine, he's five, 10. If you, uh, if you trust the dolphins, like five, nine, one ninety. So not huge, but not tiny. Uh, went to the wrong Washington school, but we're not going to hold that against him. Uh, he's a, a very talented player on a team that is definitely on the come. I think mobile quarterbacks help running backs when those mobile quarterbacks aren't 6'6", 250 pounds and stealing goal line work. Uh, this is absolutely a name to keep on your radar for those drafts where you are kind of at the end of the first, second turn and you pick wide receivers early, or if you jump up and draft Travis Kelsey in the first round, like you should, Gaskin is really one of the last good running backs that no one would be surprised if he finished inside the top 10 just week to week. And he would be ranked there if he's getting 65% of the work or he, he's just too small and he's not going to hold that, but that's why he's going in the fourth round. And it's a, it's the kind of shot you want to take if you went with other positions first in your draft. What's the right Washington school, Clark? I'm curious. Uh, the Cougars, apparently that's the family I married into. So go Cougars. Uh, rare. Gotcha. Not George Washington University. No. I also like Western Washington University, also known to me as Five U, but that's the Washington College breakdown. I, I mean, why else would you listen to the show if not for that? That's what the people come for. I'm just, I'm, I'm just amazed that you're stepping on Nick's Washington territory when Nick has been such a, a long member of the Washington community and has never brought to us a good power ranking of the Washington school. Really kind of letting us down over there, Nick. I don't give a shit, um, <laughs> but people do get testy about it here. Um, yeah. And I didn't go to any of, I didn't go to a Washington school. So I, I just choose not to care. Um, hey, good for you. 
I'm surprised by Gaskin's size. Uh, the the yeah, like you said, Clark, the team's got him in the mid 190s. At the at his pro day, he he hit 205. So somewhere in lies the truth. Uh, but I that that caught me off guard that he was listed uh, as such a such a light player. I think he's really capable. Um, his MCL sprain last year, I, I think was like I think it was grade two. So it's something to keep an eye on. I think I. I'm thinking of the Miami uh, backfield a little bit like I am Detroit, where I'm almost more interested in the number two guy, just super Mm -hmm. late. Like Jamal Williams, I think is a great thing. A great guy to just add to your roster really late in drafts. Salvin Ahmed, I think is a great guy to add to your roster really late in drafts. Um, But I do think that Gaskin offers weekly flex play like that. You don't have to think of it's not, not matchup dependent. You you just plug him in and you don't have to to worry about him. Um, The Dolphins per sharp football stats have a really nice pass catching or a pass defense schedule this year. So I think he's going to get, he's going to be heavily involved. And if he's getting like six to eight targets per week, you're, you're totally that plus like eight to 10 carries. You're totally set. You're loving, you're loving all of that. Awesome. Well, there you go. That's all we got for you this week. I apologize quickly. I said there was no I'm NFL audio news. issues right now, Pete. So if you were addressing me, I can't help you. No, I, I wasn't, Nick. It's, the show's not about you. It's about uh, football, fantasy football particularly. Uh, <clears throat> I failed to mention, we do have, there is some NFL news. Nothing major, just a, well, it is major, but it's nothing fantasy related. Just wanted to give a quick shout out to Carl Nassib defensive lineman for the uh, Las Vegas Raiders who uh, today announced that he is gay. And so shout out to uh, Carl Nassib for coming out. That's awesome. Uh, he's the first gay active player in NFL history. So um, yeah, that's amazing. I'm g- really glad that he feels comfortable doing that and uh, all the power to him. And hopefully this will just continue uh, having, you know, the impact that we hope it does and, and more people being comfortable in themselves. So, and the world being more comfortable in itself and comfortable all around, sitting on a big comfy comfiness. That's all we got for you this week. Please rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts on whatever podcast, your podcast platform of choice. And make sure you follow us on Twitter at NerdballFF. Also, if you enjoy listening to the show, think about supporting us over on our Patreon, patreon.com backslash NerdballFF. Uh, there are plenty of perks for our subscribers. And we of course appreciate whatever you're willing to contribute. You can follow myself on Twitter at Pete M. Rogers, follow Clark at NFL Clark, Jordan at Jordan underscore Smith 27 and Nicholas at ginger underscore underscore Nick without a K. And of course you make sure to check out all the amazing content we're putting out over on the site, www.nerdballff.com. Until next week, my fellow nerds. <laughs>